Well, I'm delighted to be here, um, everyone. I'm um, just so excited to um, continue to learn uh, about the wonderful things that are happening in Waterloo Region. It's uh, a really inspiring place for kids, and I think if we had more Waterloos, you know, we wouldn't have the same kinds of letters to Canada from some of our kids. Um, and uh, I've titled the presentation here, um, How Can We Make Canada a Great Country for Kids? And I promise you it's the only thing that uh, is going to sound in my presentation like something the president to the south of us might say. Um, <laughs> But I think um, you might agree, um, and we'll see, you know, when I uh, review some of the uh, data and evidence from UNICEF about how our kids are doing, that it's a valid question. Um, we've published 14 report cards now on the state of children and youth in wealthy countries over the last 17 years. And uh, we do these um, comparative international na analyses because countries with similar resources, um, similar um, GDP, similar capacities and know-how for kids achieve really different outcomes for their kids. And it's a fair question to ask why that is and really to learn from that about how we can do better. And so I'm going to present to you an index of child and youth well-being that uh, we uh, put forth in our last report card that came out in June. And I hope that it offers you some interesting insights about the national um, and international patterns and trends shaping childhood that I think um, in some ways makes your work more difficult than it should otherwise be in Canada. So um, the index of child and youth well-being in report card 14 um, really widens the frame of um, how we tend to think about child and youth well-being and how we tend to measure it. Uh, it incorporates the targets and measures that um, every country in the world, including Canada, have agreed to achieve the Sustainable Development Goals um, by 2030. Um, so it's an ambitious but measurable agenda um, and um, you'll see in some of the sustainable development goal indicators that we're measuring um, in this report some things that you're, you know, you're used to seeing um, when you look at child and youth well-being. Um, but you'll also see some new dimensions um, like environmental health and integrity which you know, we're, we're remembering now increasingly is so important to kids' physical and mental well-being. Um, and you'll also see a dimension measuring inequality. And this is something that I think, um, you know, the Western world is only coming now to grips with in terms of how much broad income inequality is, is uh, affecting the lives of our kids. Um, on the other side of the coin, really, you know, UNICEF believes we can't have sustainable and equitable societies unless our children are doing well and thriving because they are the most sensitive indicator species of the health of a society. So in the different, um, of the 17 uh, sustainable development goals that Canada has agreed to, there are actually 169 targets and they're all measurable, God bless them. Um, they, you know, again, some of the things you'll see in your shared goals that you're developing in Waterloo Region, um, there's a goal for good health, uh, for no poverty, <laughs> for quality education, for um, better protection of children, and so on. And in our index of well-being, um, we focused on the goals and targets among these 17 that are most directly uh, relevant to children and particularly children in high-income country contexts. Um, this model is maybe familiar to some of you in terms of uh, the ecology of childhood. You might have seen this model before if you've uh, been through child development um, studies. Really it's just to show you that the sustainable development um, indicators um, are relevant um, in communities. There are policy levers we have in communities, provincially and federally, that wrap around children to actually make a difference and, and um, improve on. So there's a role for all of us. And what this uh, index does that I'm going to show you momentarily is uh, compare the 41 richest countries in the world in terms of how well they're currently meeting the sustainable development goals for kids. So it's a bit of a baseline and it tells us a little bit about the ground we have to cover to 2030. 
uh, we have, of the 25 indicators um, that, again, relate to kids in rich countries, Canada has 22 that we can measure and compare internationally. So um, in the time I've got with you, I'm just going to give you a brief outline of what this data tells us about how our kids are doing and how we compare with our peer countries. Um, we're going to have a quick look at what's getting better and where we're stuck and what might actually move the needle to get us into a better place with our kids. So when we put the 22 different variables that we measure in our index together into a composite index, into um, one number, and um, rank that, uh, rank you know, the 41 countries according to that composite number, um, I don't know if you were watching the video closely because the answer was there, but um, I'd like to get a sense from you, well, not only of how alert you were, <laughs> with, yeah, I haven't had enough coffee yet, but also, um, you know, where you think Canada um, ended up in our index. So if you think that we were in the top third of uh, 41 countries in terms of overall child and youth well-being, can you stand up if we were in the top third? Okay. Uh, how about in the middle? If you think we're in the middle of the 41 countries, can you stand? Okay, thank you. And if you think we're in the bottom tercile, the bottom third of countries. All right. Thank you very much. And in fact, we rank in the middle um, at 25 out of 41. Um, that's where we've been stuck for a decade now, since UNICEF first started uh, measuring child and youth well-being. Uh, we've had five different iterations of the UNICEF index over the years, and Canada has consistently placed in the middle. Um, other countries, and it may not surprise you to know that the Nordics are stuck at the top, happily for them, uh, because they achieve better and more equitable outcomes for kids in more areas of their lives. And so they have a, a higher composite ranking. But the interesting thing is they're, they're now joined by rising performers over these 10 years that we've been tracking this. Uh, Germany has moved up, Slovenia, Korea, Japan have moved up, and the UK moved up from almost the bottom when we measured uh, the index, uh, we started, started with our index 10 years ago. They've moved up from 21 to 13th place. So being stuck is not inevitable. There's no reason to be stuck anywhere on this index. Um, when we look at the 22 variables um, in this index, every country has a certain profile and every country is, does better in some things, mediocre in some, and lags behind peer countries in other things. So this is a, a type of profile that you see in every single country. Um, in Canada, those nice high green indicators tend to all relate to the education system. And that's because Canada's you know, well-invested public education system produces pretty good outcomes for kids. Our kids achieve you know, good grades compared to um, many other uh, countries. And we do it pretty equitably. So being in low income or in a marginalized group um, doesn't affect how well you do in school in Canada as much as it does in a lot of our peer countries. And that's why we see um, that green. Uh, I think where it's more useful to focus is, you know, is to learn from the green, um, and there are some lessons there about, again, investing in good, universal, strong public services for kids, um, but it's where we're lagging behind in the red that I think deserves a lot more attention, and um, here is where you see um, indicators that mainly relate to children's health and to the levels of violence that our kids experience. And so rates of teen suicide and child homicide in Canada are much higher than in um, many of our peer countries. They are, you know, relatively speaking, um, r rare uh, forms of violence, but they do signify the tip of a larger iceberg of violence and more prevalent forms like bullying, which are also down there at the bottom. And also here in the red, um, you'll see that one in five of our kids lives in relative income poverty. 
and that is linked to high levels of infant mortality, food insecurity, and unhealthy weight. And that's why those things are together at the bottom. Um, I just want to acknowledge that these are based on national averages and you know there's lots of kids and their stories and, and communities in Canada that are rolling up into this big picture but of course there's a lot of variation right national averages mask um, variation and um, when we looked at each of these variables and we looked at some of the um, groups in Canada that are experiencing really difficult outcomes like indigenous children in some cases they were literally off the chart um, even you know, looking at the worst performing countries when it comes to um, suicide among indigenous children, you know, they'd be way off the chart in terms of their rate. Um, so one way to understand how well we're doing for kids is measuring the distance between um, what we're achieving in Canada and what's actually achievable in practice uh, by our peers. And we call that the possibility gap, because if, you know, if other countries can, can do better, the question is, is, um, is valid, why, why can't we and what can we learn from that? But another measure of, um, of our progress is how we're making progress over time and how um, indicators may be improving or not in Canada over time. So. Uh, I'd like you to, if you will, uh, join me in a one-minute challenge here, and um, you will find on your tables at least two envelopes, and if you could, um, in pairs, or maybe groups of three, depending on the size of your table, open the envelope, you'll find um, six cards, and each of these cards is an indicator in our index. And um, in one minute, I'd like you to group the indicators you think have improved over the past decade in Canada to your left and group the indicators that you think haven't changed um, or maybe have gotten worse uh, on your right. Okay, so it's going to look something like this. You'll have a group of cards on your left and a group on your right. One minute. Okay, everyone, let's uh, see what you've come up with.
I don't know if we're going to add more surprises to your placemat, um, but on the positive side of the ledger here in Canada, um, you'll see that teen drinking, uh, that te rate of teen drinking has improved. And we're talking about binge drinking, so unhealthy behaviors. Um, the rate of child homicide has improved along with the overall rate. And overall income inequality has just started to improve. Um, on the negative side of the ledger, you'll find bullying, teen mental health, and bottom end inequality. Um, so just to dig into these a little bit more and briefly, um, on the positive side of the ledger in green, if you're having difficulty reading that, um, teen drunkenness, teen births, if we added cannabis use and other so-called adolescent risk behaviors, we would see a decline, a steady decline in Canada. And this is true in just about every industrialized country in the world. Um, these risk behaviors have been declining over time. Um, however, um, teen mental health and bullying have um, tend to deteriorate over time across our country. Some countries have managed to reduce bullying but teen mental health is um, declining in most countries. And um, in terms of inequality dynamics, the SDGs pay a lot of attention to inequality and cut it different ways because, again, we're just starting to recognize, in, it, certainly in UNICEF research, but in um, a lot of other research within Canada and internationally, just how much of an effect broad income inequality is having on our kids. And so um, where Canada has improved is really in the upper um, income deciles. So um, we're starting to get a grip on the runaway inequality at the top end. Um, we're seeing uh, families in the middle starting to do a little bit better and getting into the, the bottom quarter of it, income um, families starting to improve. But what's getting worse is the bottom end. The bottom end is is getting away from us and um, that's why you'll see some different measures of inequality and why it's really important to measure it so many different ways because it tells you um, you know where we're really going to have to be targeting our our resources um, one other comment i want to make about the patterns we're seeing here is you may notice that of the 22 indicators we're measuring uh, only seven are on the positive side of the ledger Seven have improved over a decade. The rest have gotten worse or stayed the same. And when we produced our, our um, index in 2013, uh, only five indicators had gotten worse. And this is concerning us because it seems to indicate a pattern of slowing down and making progress. Um, at the same time, you know, as the Canadian Index of Well-Being here at, in Waterloo, um, you know, shows us very well, GDP keeps rising. The GDP progress curve is, is like that, straight up. Our indicators for kids and our social indicators generally are pretty flat. So where is that wealth accumulation going and where are the dividends for kids, we would ask. Um, so this is a, a comic that appeared in uh, the UK in 2007 <laughs> in The Guardian when we first published our UNICEF index again, a decade ago. Um, it, uh, again, I mentioned before, the UK was at the bottom, and um, it caused a lot of um, discussion and debate in the UK. And, um, you know, a lot of consternation. The government um, took that data seriously. And, uh, you know, as I mentioned before, the UK has since moved up from 21st place to 13. And I'm going to tell you how they did it momentarily, but um, before I get there, you know, a good question is, again, why? Um, why is Canada still stuck? Why are other countries able to move? And why are some stuck at the top? Um, what we're really starting to get a handle on um, in our research is the, again, the impact of inequality, and here it is in this scatter graph. The countries in the top right of this chart are the ones that have better outcomes for kids, so more kids are doing well, and the gaps between their kids are smaller. They don't have such inequities in any given indicator uh, among their kids. Not only that, um, the countries that um, you find you know, towards the middle, like Canada, and the bottom um, left quadrant, 
These are the countries that are, um, have more income inequality, they have poorer outcomes for kids, their kids have more inequality, and these are the countries that have the worst health and violence outcomes. So there seems to be something um, in the nature of income inequality dynamics um, that trickle down and translate to poorer health and more violence in societies, and that's the classic profile that Canada has. Um, the countries that have experienced um, more growth in income inequality over the last 15 years are the ones that have experienced the least progress in child outcomes. And we think it's no coincidence that Canada is one of those countries. We're a handful of countries that had wider income inequality growth and less progress for our kids. And so we have today, we're sitting at moderate income inequality and guess what? Moderate outcomes for kids. Why? Why might income inequality be playing such a, a role? We're not totally sure, but you know, some of the signals that we're picking up um, are that wider income inequality seems to come with more social competition, um, more stress and anxiety living in an income um, unequal society. We're more individualistic. Um, you know, when kids are at the bottom of a steeper gradient, it's easier to give up, it's easier to have fewer aspirations, um, and there are fewer expectations of those kids to do well. And kids in the middle, because this is not just a problem confined to marginal groups, kids in the middle have a difficult time, because what do we do? We tend to put more pressure on them to succeed. You know, do well in school, get those grades, or you know, that elusive job in our competitive, unequal society may not be yours. And um, it may be no coincidence that that's also partly why we're seeing um, more anxiety among our kids and um, more stress and, and mental health problems. What also happens in more unequal societies is there tends to be less um, public agreement, less social cohesion. Um, we're more individualistic and this makes investing in good quality universal programs more difficult. And so what do we do? We target you know, less money um, to those who need it most, as opposed to investing more broadly. I think you know the exception in Canada is that we think public education is important, um, so we're we're happy to invest you know universally in that. But it's so much harder to invest in early child care and learning and in mental health services. And so we think inequality might be the canary in the coal mine for child and youth well-being. And so what do we do about that? Um, you know, rich countries have very different outcomes, not because our parents and kids are so different than anywhere else. It's because our public policies are different. That is the difference maker. And there are two things that the top ranked countries do much more of than we do here, and things that the UK started to do a decade ago that have helped them move up. One of those things is to address broad income inequality. And you know, there's different policy levers to do this. Um, the Canada Child Benefit is one of them. Um, some provinces, you know, uh, have been boosting their um, child benefits, and so bringing families um, together um, in income and giving them what they need, you know, to invest in good child development is really important. But private incomes do not purchase all the things kids need for good development. So investing earlier and bending the cost curve to invest in more universal, early child care, um, inequalities show up before kids start school. This also you know, has a virtuous um, cycle in terms of helping reduce inequality, um, but also joining up their health, their child development, and their early child care programs. Um, to really tightly wrap around kids is what they do. And these are the two things that we think are the difference makers. Um, you know, the third thing, if, if we can do more of those in Canada, we should get better outcomes. The third thing we can do is, again, continue to lean on those lagging indicators and really understand where do we need to improve and um, work with kids to do that. Um, Brock's gonna tell you a little bit more about how UNICEF Canada and partners that we have are, are um, helping to lean on these lagging indicators and involving kids in the solutions. Um, but I would also ask you, you know, to, to think about what are the policy levers in your region um, to act on these things, and do you have the data, you know, to understand where your greatest challenges are, 
um, to understand how unequal as a community you may be. Um, and you know, we recognize that not everything that is important um, to kids can be measured. Um, and the sustainable development goals are pretty fundamental in terms of some of the things they measure. Um, but they're a partial view, and that's why um, we're working on a Canadian index of child and youth well-being that will help fill in some of those gaps, and you'll see a lot more of the subjective indicators that you are identifying in your shared goals, um, because it's really, in rich countries, how kids feel about their well-being that is really critical, you know, more than just meeting basic needs. And Christine will tell you a little bit more about how we're developing that index. So, some challenges for today. <laughs> on our plate, but thank you very much for your time. And if you want to know more, uh, unicef.ca slash IRC14 has our report card and our index. And I'm happy to answer any questions throughout the day. Thanks. Hi everyone, feels nice to be back in this room. Um, so as Lisa mentioned, I'm going to talk a little bit about today about our own process and developing uh, an index that is specific to Canada's children and youth, what we are calling the Canadian Index of Child and Youth Wellbeing, or the CY Index, and the key role that young people have played and really continue to play throughout this process. So the CY Index has a vision to enable all children and youth to achieve their well-being goals and provide every opportunity for great outcomes by reporting on progress, identifying priorities, and inspiring action. Um, so it's really just a way for us to measure and track the progress of children and youth in Canada. The process really began back in 2013 to try to understand why Canada persists in the middle of these international league tables in these UNICEF report cards and to understand why this was happening. So starting our journey with overlap, we moved into a research and discovery phase, um, really digging deeper into understanding why Canada is stuck in the middle, um, understanding challenges and experiences and supporting well-being. Um, there's a lot of mythology around why Canada seems to be struggling. That moved us into a research and design phase, um, really looking at what we wanted to achieve and how we were going to get there. That was followed by more research, and now even more research. So with the help of the Canadian Index of Wellbeing, uh, the aim of this current focus, aim of this current phase, is to focus on what will we measure. Um, so we've been looking at research about child and youth wellbeing learning how to build indices, dashboards, indicators. We review normative frameworks that are being used across Canada and internationally and figuring out how to best to articulate with them. Um, the index is also being developed through various consultations and activities, in particular with our advisory reference group, of which the Children Youth Planning Table is a part, um, through the general population and surveys, and of course, young people. Some questions that we've asked along the way are what makes a difference among peer countries, what is child and youth well-being? Who is measuring what and how are they doing it? And most importantly, what does well-being mean to children and youth? If we were going to track and measure the well-being of children and youth, we have to understand what well-being actually means to children and youth. So that brings us to My Cat Makes Me Happy. It is a report that was released in August of this year. It is based on research that was done in 2016. It's really a synthesis of youth voices, um, hearing or looking at what young people have had to say in various studies through a literature review, and also hearing what young people have had to say about their well-being through a national youth conference, as well as a series of workshops that have been done across Canada. Young people actually participated as researchers in this project. Um, through the literature review, they identified domains, themes of well-being, and specific indicators or measures. So this report provided us with a lot of really valuable information uh, about child and youth well-being. Um, so specifically looking at the literature review, we see that subjective well-being is important to well-being. Probably not surprising to any of us, um, but young people often um, report that the quality of their lives and the experiences that they have um, really affect their well-being. For example, high school graduation rate is often used as a measure of well-being. 
um, as it indicates an important developmental milestone, but it, it does not always indicate a positive transition for young people who may not be going off to post-secondary education or into employment, or for young people in care who may be leaving a supportive home environment and moving into a challenging period of autonomy. So it's important for us to uh, look at the big picture when we're looking at individual aspects of well-being. We also see that well-being is holistic. Young people report time and time again that they may be doing well in one aspect of their lives, maybe they're doing well in education or living independently, but struggling in other aspects. But because it looks like they're doing well, they don't receive the support they need and they end up falling through the cracks. This is why we don't look at just one measure of well-being. We also see that poverty and discrimination are detrimental to well-being. We know poverty does not just mean low income, meaning young people may not receive the supports or resources that they need to thrive, um, but that young people report feeling excluded or treated differently because they live in poverty, which is connected to the last point. Well-being is directly related to relationships and a sense of belonging to their society. This is especially true for young people who are often excluded or marginalized, such as indigenous youth, LGBTQ2S plus youth, refugee youth, immigrant youth. To make sure that we were on the right track after getting all this information through the literature review, the next step was to actually talk to young people and hear what they had to say. So this was done through a National Young Decision Makers Conference, which took place in March 2016 in Ontario. There were 145 young people there from every province and territory, 69 of whom identified as Indigenous and 21 had various abilities. Youth workshops also took place in fall 2016. There were six workshops in total uh, with 84 young people ranging in age from 11 to 21. They lasted three to six hours each and there were many differences in terms of age, location, experience, and culture. So the youth workshops took place in Whitehorse, Yukon with eight young people that all identified as indigenous and they all had faced challenges with the mainstream school curriculum and environment. Another workshop took place in Victoria with eight young people who had various abilities. They were diverse in age, gender, some were indigenous, some spoke English as a second language. Another workshop took place here in Kitchener with 18 young people, five of whom had recently immigrated to Canada and spoke English as a second language. Many different experiences, backgrounds, cultures. Another workshop in Toronto with 20 young people, different ages, came from different backgrounds, attended different schools, um, gave us some insight in more of an urban context. Another workshop took place in a very remote community in Quebec in Manawan. Um, all 20 young people were indigenous and lived on a First Nations reserve. And another workshop took place in Atlantic Canada, uh, did not take place in the ocean. Um, but for privacy concerns, the exact location is kept confidential. Um, so there were 10 male identified young people in that workshop. So the actual workshop process, uh, the workshops were conducted by the Students Commission of Canada. Um, so the wonderful facilitators there developed an outline to start off by building a safe space, um, establishing positive relationships between participants as well as between participants and the facilitator. They introduced the workshop, explained the index a little bit, and explained how this, the information was going to be used. So some questions that were asked were, what is well-being? What does well-being mean to other young Canadians? What is important to your well-being? There was a lot of group work, individual and group thinking, various activities done throughout the workshops to keep the energy levels up. Um, and in terms of content, young people were able to talk about the information, talk about what was important to their well-being. They were able to add indicators to the wall, debated and discussed. For example, social media was something that came up. One young person thought it should fit in youth engagement. Another young person thought it better fit in health because it affected their mental health. So they were able to learn from each other and we learned from them. The end result was that they built their very own index. If we see in the larger cards, youth engagement, relatedness, education, and employment, and equity, sort of the domains or main themes of well-being. And underneath those are more specific aspects of well-being. Under relatedness, we see family, friendship. Under equity, we see racism, LGBTQ+, and prejudice. 
So quickly, just some adaptations that were done to ensure that all the workshops were culturally relevant to each participant. For cultural inclusion in Whitehorse, uh, the workshop was organized using the medicine wheel, so looking at emotional, spiritual, physical, and mental health. They allowed lots of time for storytelling. Most workshops did last three hours. This one in particular lasted about six. Uh, they opened the workshop with prayer from a local elder, and also one of the co-facilitators was Indigenous. There was the inclusion of different abilities. Um, in particular, there were varying levels of literacy, so in those cases, um, facilitators would write down any thoughts that participants may have or um, participants could partner up and another participant would write down their thoughts. And for the inclusion of Francophone youth in Manoa, Quebec, the workshop was translated into French and the facilitators were Francophone. It was an Indigenous group so they ensured the workshop was culturally relevant and they did offer a gift to the young workshop organizer following cultural protocols. So what did we actually learn from these workshops? Uh, young people prioritize domains and themes and identify potential measures, as we saw in that previous image, um, looking at youth engagement, relatedness, um, education, employment, as sort of domains or overall themes. Um, and then they were able to get a little bit more specific and help us understand what those domains actually meant to them. Despite going to many different areas across Canada and talking to 84 very different young people, there are more similarities than differences. A thought echoed by a youth workshop participant who said for youth, um, I can't read that far, um, <laughs> um, that youth are all dealing with the, uh, the same issues at, uh, at the core. Um, uh, they also identified things we weren't considering and highlighted the need to find new ways to measure well-being. Um, oftentimes, Surveys are not asking information to get fulsome responses, or asking questions to get fulsome responses, um, or they're not done on a national level. Um, one example is belonging is often expressed in terms of relationships, um, but belonging does happen in spaces and systems, and often that is not covered. Um, young people often report feeling connected to cultures, um, having culturally relevant programming, or having visible representation in key decision-making roles. And it reaffirmed the importance of talking to and including young people. Um, young people tell us things that adults never would have thought of. And one youth workshop participant saying, I'll make a voice for myself. Um, so the domains that young people prioritized that were the most important to their well-being were health, relatedness, and equity followed by education and employment, youth engagement, affordable living conditions, space and environment. And the important, more specific themes or measures um, that young people said were important to their well-being were mental health, youth activities, inclusive education, physical health, discrimination, belonging, access to appropriate health care, friendship, permanent caring relationships with one or more adults, and respect. Um, if we want to see how these stack up to the six shared goals for children and youth, for goal one, feeling valued, heard, and included, specifically feeling welcomed that they belong, we see that in belonging, feeling that they are valued members of community, we see in discrimination and respect, having opportunities to participate and contribute, we see in youth activities. For goal two, are safe and supported by caring adults, being connected to a network of positive, responsive adults, we see that in permanent caring relationships with one or more adults. For goal three, are physically healthy, we see physical health, access to healthcare from prenatal on, access to appropriate healthcare. For goal four, are emotionally healthy, being supported in their mental health, mental health is right at the top, engaging in healthy relationships with peers, we see that in friendship. And for goal five, are lifelong learners, we see that in inclusive education. So goal six can see a positive future for themselves, while not in the top 10, still definitely a theme discussed in workshops. Um, and if we look a little bit closer at opportunities to help them meet goals, maybe through volunteer or employment, that's buried somewhere in youth activities and being connected to something meaningful in the community, that's somewhere in belonging. Um, so here in Waterloo Region, we're looking at aspects of well-being that are applicable to children and youth all across the country. Again, more similarities than differences. 
So this is all really great information, um, but what are we actually going to do with it? Um, so we took the list of domains, themes, measures, indicators from these workshops. We took information from other research about child and youth well-being. Um, different normative frameworks had various consultations with our experts, our advisory reference group, and created a new list of domains and measures to actually feed back to young people. So this fall, there were four additional workshops in Whitehorse, Kitchener, Toronto, Manoa. Toronto workshop is actually happening this Thursday, so three have been completed, one still to be done. And to give you a little bit of an idea of what came out of these workshops, um, I will ask you a question um, to get at some of the information that we collected from young people. So they were given a list of eight domains and then corresponding measures. And they had green dots, and using dotmocracy, they voted on the measures or indicators that were most important to their well-being. So I'm going to ask you a question specifically about the spaces and environment domain. There were eight measures or indicators within that domain. And so your question is, which pairing has the highest ranking measures as voted on by youth in the spaces and environment domain? Again, there were eight measures. So one of these groups has the highest and second highest ranking measures, meaning they received the most green dots. Another pair has the third and fourth highest ranking measures, and so on. So is it A, awareness of environmental problems, access to public facilities and resources, B, public transportation, and access to spaces, places that are welcoming, supportive, and inclusive, C, satisfaction with the local area, access to open space and natural environment, or D, water quality and air quality. So with just a good old-fashioned show of hands, who thinks that it's A? Okay, B. Okay, C and D. Okay, so I think B was had the highest votes from the room. So the highest ranking pair was actually water quality and air quality. So air, water quality received 24 green dots and air quality received 19. The second highest was B. Um, public transportation had nine dots. Access to spaces, places that are welcoming, supportive, and inclusive had eight. And then it was A, awareness of environmental problems and access to public facilities, each had seven. And then finally C, satisfaction with the local area, and access to open space and natural environment, each had four green dots. Um, so this is why we go to young people to hear what they actually have to say. Young people are also able to give us a little bit more context. Um, water quality and air quality often reflect the realities of their communities, um, something that we may take for granted here. Um, maybe thinking in Whitehorse, maybe that received the most votes. Maybe in Manawan, it's a rem rem remote community. Maybe that received the most votes. Um, it actually received the most votes in Whitehorse and Kitchener. Um, and less so in Manawan. So we really don't know what kind of information we're going to get out of each workshop. Um, young people also gave us, gave us some information about what may be a better way to measure something. Um, for example, having opportunities to promote sustainability came up. Um, perhaps that's a better way um, to measure environmental problems than awareness of environmental problems. Um, so that gives us some information to think about. And I'll just finish with some interesting notes that came out of these workshops and stuff for us to think about moving forward. Uh, the workshops help us understand how to communicate the index to young people. So young people were given green dots to vote on what was most important to them. They were also given red dots to vote on things that weren't that important to them. What ended up happening was that young people used their red dots um, to put beside measures that they had a negative reaction to. For example, bullying received a lot of green dots but received a lot of red dots. So those are particular measures, indicators that we really need to pay attention to. Um, some young people also felt as though the index was being used to judge them. For example, overweight and obesity. They said, there's a lot of things that affect this. It's not our fault. Why are we being judged on it? We know there are various factors that affect that, um, but it's important for us to communicate that to young people. While there are more similarities and differences, there are still differences among different communities. 
Um, for example, housing was something that was not rated that important in Manawan because the ban deals with the housing on the First Nation Reserve. Um, just highlighting the importance of going to many different communities across Canada. And young people are more interested in the quali qualitative information, the why. Young people aren't really interested in the frequency of cannabis use. They're interested in why they and their peers use it. Um, is it to cope with problems, deal with anxiety? Um, in one case, it was to increase appetite to deal with an existing medical condition. And there was divergence between experts and young people. Um, we had an activity with our advisory reference group, our experts, no doubt give us a lot of really valuable and important information, um, but feeling balanced spiritually, physically, emotionally, and mentally was not really ranked as that important to our experts, ranked very important from our young people. Also caring for having a pet, not ranked as high from our experts. We have an entire report called My Cat Makes Me Happy because it is brought up time and time again by young people. Um, it is two different perspectives. Our experts are looking at what do we measure? How do we measure this? What does it actually mean? Young people are just telling us that it's important, so we need to listen to them. And I'll just leave you with this final quote. Being in this youth meeting, connecting with their young people made me feel a sense of hope. There's so many bright young minds that can do a lot to bring progress. Thank you.